And region two can be defined as flow out of the control volume, but that which remains part of the system. Okay. And I want you to consider these here, regions one and two, uh, because this is this has occurred over a very small time step, delta t. Uh, we'll consider these these volumes, these regions one and two, uh, to be very small volumes. In other words, we'd say delta volume one and delta v two. All right, so at this point, um, right, so the flow has carried parts of the system across the control surfaces, that is, the, the edges of the control volumes. Some is left, new flow has entered. And so what we do now is uh, do a little bit of bookkeeping on how much flow has entered and exited. Um, so if we said volume of the system okay, at this new time step, t plus delta t, is equal to the volume of the control volume at this new time step minus the new flow in and plus the flow out. Let's do a quick little, uh, a, a little bit of a, uh, a sanity check on this, whether this makes sense. If we want to get the blue region, if we take red hatched region, subtract out the part that is on the left, region 1, and add region 2, then we should recover our system. Right. Similarly, if we wanted to figure out how much of our extensive property is left in our system at this time step, we would say V D plus delta T minus where these represent the amount of whatever this extensive property is in regions one and two. Next, let's uh, try taking the difference between B of the system at this new time step and the time step we started at. In other words, if we say B system at T minus B system at T when we started, right? And we divide by delta T, then writing this out, we'll get something like VCV T plus delta T minus VCV. Okay. So we've simply taken the expressions we had for B, the system, at these two time steps and taken the difference, divided it by the time step itself. Of course, right, at time t, um, regions 1 and zero, uh, 2 are, are basically 0. We've, we've defined that, you know, at, at, at t there's no part of the system that is outside the control volume. And there's no part of the control volume that doesn't contain the system. Uh, but we'll keep it there because it's, I mean, it's valid to, to write a quantity is just equal to zero. So what happens then with, a, with, a, with an expression like this, what happens is the limit of delta t approaches zero. What do we call this? Back to basic calculus here. That'd be the, the time derivative of big B in the system. Right? And because we're doing a Right, if we're tracking the rate of change of B in a system, that's a Lagrangian rate of change, we're going to use this capital D 
for the derivative. Um, and same for the other quantities here. We're taking the difference over a time step divided by the time step. So we could write d b c b d t minus d b one d t plus delta b two d t. All right. Uh, so capital D indicates Lagrangian rate of change, and in these cases, we're using partial derivatives in the normal convention to indicate. Uh, we're talking about Eulerian rates of change. So really, the rate of growth of, of B1 and B2 here can be thought of as the rate of B into the control volume and the rate of B out of the control volume. So quick interpretation of these terms, okay. DDT of B C V be thought of as the unsteady in an Eulerian sense rate of change of B inside the control volume. So, for example, if our flow is unsteady, maybe if we have a compressible flow or something, and the density of the of the flow is increasing gradually over time, okay, um, then we would end up with right. Even if the flow is completely steady, uh, sorry, even if the flow the, there was no velocity, right, no, no no b being carried in and out of the control volume, uh, this would tell us the rate of change of the of the mass contained within that region of space, just because of the things changing inside of its boundaries. B dot in is the transport B into our control volume, which is known as influx. And B dot out is known as the, or is the transport of B out of the control volume, which is known as efflux. And both of these, right, are due to B carried across the control surfaces. that are bounding the control volume. So a quick little uh, qualitative example before we get into uh, more mathematics. Uh, this is 466 from the book. The idea is, uh, suppose that we've got a rectangular or a, a rectangular section of a, uh, you know what, let me make it a little bit larger, a rectangular section of a channel, okay, this thing is uh, five feet across, let's go ahead and say it's ten feet long, and Right, this is our, in this case, this would be um, a region of interest. This would be our control volume. And we have flow that looks like this. In other words, we have uniform flow. Oops. We have uniform flow of one foot per second over over a two foot width by each side and then the center one foot wide section of the channel has 
a flow speed of six feet per second. Okay. And then leaving the channel, we have a completely uniform flow velocity of two feet per second. So what we're seeking to find in this problem is really, I say qualitative, because we're not doing much with numbers here, uh, is we want to sketch the system 0 0.5 seconds, uh, we'll say, after this initial sketch is shown. And we want to delineate the fluid that has entered or left the control volume. Okay, so this is fairly a fairly straightforward process because of the fact that we've got this uh, these these piecewise uniform sections of flow. So here's our channel again. Uh, so at the right hand boundary here, where the flow is occurring out at two feet per second. Um, if we say, uh, let's go ahead and draw our system, our initial system here, okay, in green dashed lines. How far has the kind of the right hand limit of our system traveled in that half a second? Moved at two feet per second over half a second, it's going to move one foot, right? In other words, this is one foot is equal to that two feet per second times 0 0.5 seconds. Okay, so that's how far that slug of fluid has moved outside of the control volume at that point. Um, now, at the left hand side, this section that's going one foot per second, how far into the control volume will that have penetrated? moved 0 0.5 feet, right? Because it's at one foot per second times 0 0.5 seconds, the amount of time we've, we've it, it's elapsed. And then this middle section that is uh, moving at six feet per second on the left-hand side will have traveled three feet, right? Six feet per second times half a second. And so our new the new shape of our system right, is this green patched region here. So it is deformed and it's moved, but we can take, keep track of it simply by observing how it's flowing in and out of the control volume. Uh, now, flow that has entered the control volume, we'll go ahead and mark with blue. Clearly, that's going to be everything in the control volume that isn't part of the original system. All right, so we'd call this flow in, and then parts of the system that are no longer in the control volume. Flow out of the control volume. Okay. Any questions here? So this flow across control surfaces, this example is supposed to show how, how important it is to properly account for the way flow is moving across control surfaces, because that's how stuff gets in and out of control volumes. Um, and so we need to spend a few minutes on um, a bit more rigorous of a treatment of these influx and efflux terms that we introduced a second ago. Influx, 
this this section here is going to necessitate that we use some uh, some vector calculus. So if you are rusty at your vector calc or seeing it in this lecture doesn't really stick or click, uh, I want to emphasize you need to go back and read the section in the book and get comfortable with it because this is one of the most important topics. This is, we're going to keep coming back to this way of calculating influx and efflux. Um, okay, so <coughs> influx and efflux is simply the flow across our control surfaces. Which, right, and flow across a control surface can either be in or out. Influx, efflux. So we'll talk about first. Um, oops. So let's let's consider our uh, our potato shaped control volume again, and right <coughs> our V. So we've got our our control volume, and we've got our velocity field. Uh, so if we look at the regions where flow is entering, right? We highlight that. This would be the region where we consider there to be influx. And if we look at the regions where flow is exiting, that would be where efflux occurs. Um, something to point out here. Uh, I want to. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second, but um, we're going to need to establish surface normal vectors um, on our control volume or on our control surfaces. And the convention for that is that the normal vector that we put on the surface, right, just needs to be perpendicular to the surface, unit length, and it always points out of the control volume and into the fluid. Um, okay, so it's always, if you draw your surface normal vectors all over this thing, it should end up looking, you know, like a porcupine. Uh, if your surface normal vector is pointing in, you've got it backwards and you need to flip it around. Uh, this is important because of this. So let's, let's, Consider, uh, if we, let's take a tiny little chunk of this region where we have influx, okay? Right? So influx, which contributes to our B in term, right? So consider that little chunk that we've carved out. We'll draw it as a, uh, yeah, actually. We'll consider it a little, um, tiny little area, all right? So, uh, so this is a piece of our control surface with area delta A. So it's very small. And we've defined that our surface normal, right, is directed out from the control surface. At the same time, right, because of the way the velocity is uh, shown here, the velocity at this delta A here might not be perfectly aligned with the surface normal vector. Um, so we've got our velocity and, and, okay. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, right, if, if our velocity, if our flow velocity V, um, is what is responsible for carrying fluid and the associated extensive properties, across the control surface, how much of the velocity is actually doing that? Um, so if we consider like our, our normal vector here, and we can set up a coordinate system that has a normal vector sticking straight out from the surface and a couple of tangent vectors that act tangentially to the surface, um, that's a valid coordinate system. And we could write our velocity in that coordinate system. Right? So it would be a velocity component that is normal to the surface, a velocity component that is tangential to the surface in one direction, and a velocity component that's tangential to the surface in another direction. Okay. Which of those three components is going to actually move flow across the control surface? Only the normal component, right? That is the part of the velocity that is directed perpendicular to the surface. Um, only the normal component of V carries flow across the control surface. Um, so to calculate, right? Well, so we'll call this uh, we'll call this normal component V sub n, 
and we can calculate v sub n using a dot product. So v sub n is equal to the dot product between v and n. Um, oh, we want a, in this case, we want a negative dot product between v and n. Uh, sorry, I take that back. We don't forget that negative sign. Um, right, so this is the component of v exists perpendicular to our little section delta a. So if we want to account for how much um, of an extensive property big B is being carried across this little tiny piece of our, uh, our control surface, by the velocity at that point, we could write um, tiny little B dot in right, is equal to negative rho B VN DA. All right? Basically, we've got uh, rho times B times DA is going to give us the amount of B per unit, like depth. And then the velocity, normal to the surface area there is going to give us the amount of distance traveled per unit time. So this tells us, if we look at uh, just the Vn dot dA, that's the amount of volumetric, right? The, the amount of volume being carried across the control surface per unit time. Multiply that unit per amount of volume by B, we get the amount of, um, or sorry, by rho, we get the amount of mass per unit time. And then by little b, we get the amount of big B per unit time crossing just that tiny little area. And so, right, if we wanted to um, count up every little piece where <laughs> influx is occurring, we would write integral across the inflow portion of a control surface, negative rho b v dot product with n d a. Okay, oh, we're going to be careful. Uh, Note that we do have a negative sign here. Okay, this negative sign accounts for the fact um, that when you take the dot product of v and n at the inflow at the inflow portion of the control surface, they're pointing in opposite directions, right? Or at least substantially in opposite directions. Which means when you take the dot product, you're going to get a negative number. Um, we want to figure out how much flow is occurring in, so we want a positive number. So that negative sign simply accounts for the fact that we get a negative falling out of our dot product. We'll take care of that in just a second. Um, but first, I want to concentrate on the efflux, right, which gives us our B out term. So similarly, if yeah, so let me scroll up here for a second. Similarly, if we took a tiny little portion of this part of the control surface where flow is occurring outward, we could draw this the normal unit vector, and again, some velocity v at the center of it. This also will have a unit or an area of delta A. And once again, we can write that the normal component of the velocity is equal to V dot N, that the amount of uh, B being carried out, written as rho B V N delta area, and then that B dot out would be the integral over the outflow portion of the control surface of rho b b dot n delta a. Here we don't need a negative sign because uh, because of the fact that 
n and v are pointing in substantially the same direction. So when you take the dot product of the two, you're going to get a positive number. Okay. Uh, so let's put it all together, right? Um, let's or let's put together the. Uh, well, I guess the last the last component we didn't account for. So this takes care of our flow across the control surfaces, the inlet and the outlet portion. Um, let's also consider the the change inside the control volume, right? Which is the DDT of B in the control volume. Uh, we defined the rate of change or the amount of B in a control volume as right B C V being equal to the integral over the control volume of rho B D V. So it stands to reason that the time rate of change B C V would simply be written as D D T integral over the control volume of rho B dB. Okay, so now if we write out um, all of these terms together in uh, our sort of our, our, our initial version of the Reynolds transport theorem that we proposed last time. That is, we said that d b of a system dt is equal to right time rate of change of b c v minus b dot in plus b dot out. We've gone through and we've come up with expressions for each of these terms in the last page or so. so let's write those. ddt integral over the control volume of rho b dv. Okay, so that gives us our rate of change in the control volume minus okay, negative integral over the control surface inlet of rho b v dot n dA plus the integral over the control surface outlet portion rho b v dot n dA. All right. Um, So first things first, we notice we've got a negative negative, so these guys can cancel out and we end up with a positive instead. And then the other thing we can notice is that, uh, well, the inside of both of these integrals, right, the integrands are the same. Okay, we're integrating the same quantities, but over different domains. And so when we do that, we can simply add together those domains, right? We can integrate over the union of the control surface inlet and the control surface outlet. Well. Right? If we combine the in inflow portion and the outflow portion, plus any portions where there's absolutely no flow at all, we get the entire control surface. Right? So we can rewrite this instead as DDT, CV, rho, V, DV, plus the integral over the entire control surface of rho, V, V dot N, DA. Okay, so this second part here, just this single integral accounts for B out minus B in. And then on the left hand side we set this all equal to DDT of B system. Okay, so this here is the entire is the full expression of Reynolds transport theorem or as we'll call it in shorthand the RTT uh, for most of this class and, uh, and it's one of the most powerful tools that we're going to uh, use. In fact this, this pretty much dominates the entire next chapter, chapter 5 uh, doing this stuff we call finite control volume analysis uh, and it allows us to do some really neat stuff. For example, um, uh, things that this we can do using this expression in control volume analysis. Um, 
if we wanted to figure out how much thrust is being produced by a jet engine, okay, uh, this enables us to simply draw a box around the jet engine, measure the speed of flow at the control surfaces, okay, where flow is going in or out. That means at the inlet and the outlet of the jet engine. We just measure the velocity, we measure the density, and B, in that case, big B, would be uh, the amount of momentum, right? Because Newton's second law, force is equal to rate of change of momentum. This is rate of change of momentum right here. If we see big B is equal to momentum. Uh, and so little b becomes velocity itself. So we end up saying we want to measure the change in velocity between the inlet and the outlet. And simply plugging those values into this expression right here will give us the amount of thrust that's being produced inside the box. Uh, that will we'll cover that in a whole lot more detail in the next chapter. But uh, I, I, want, I don't want to understate how useful of an expression this really is, even though right now it's a little bit abstract. OK. Um, Some notes about applying the Reynolds Transport Theorem. So uh, some tips, notes, tricks. Uh, I have a couple of examples. We may, but there's, there's some important stuff we have to get through first. Again, if we don't get to the examples in here, I'll post them online on ICON. Um, if, right. Um, so if the flow across our control surfaces uh, is uniform, things get much easier. So for example, consider uh, a case where we've got maybe a pipe that has an outlet here and an outlet here. So we've got uniform flow coming in here uniform flow exiting here and uniform flow exiting here as well. Okay, our control surf our control volume would be enclosed by a control surface that looks like this. could write that D, right, B of system with time right, is equal to the time rate of change of everything going on in the control volume, rho B dV, plus the integral of the control surface of rho B B dot N dA. Well, the second integral is the one that we I want to talk about here um, because the control surface, right, we, the only part we actually need to worry about this integral is where flow is crossing. So we don't need to worry about the boundaries that exist parallel to the flow, um, where flow can't cross them, because that v dot n term will go to zero there anyway. Right? If there's not a component of flow normal to the control surface, it falls out, becomes zero. So instead, this sort of becomes, uh, this portion here becomes the integral over control surface one, which we'll define right here, you know, of everything in there, plus the integral over control surface two, which we'll go ahead and define right here, of everything dA, plus the integral over control surface three, which we'll define over here, everything dA. And then, so, T Okay. Um, now if we want to integrate over the control surface one, for example, uh, the integral over C S one of rho oops, B V dot N D A. All right. The reason it's, this is, this is a good illustration of what, how things become easier when you have uniform flow is that if it's a uniform flow, that means that V does not change over the area. Okay, so it becomes a constant. 
and v dot n becomes a constant. And if it's a constant, you can move it outside of the interval. Uh, likewise, here, let's go ahead and assume that maybe uh, rho and b, it's, maybe it's an incompressible flow. Okay, and if we assume that b is also <laughs> constant over the area, we can, if v and rho and b are constant over area 1, which is what we would call uniform flow, then this simply becomes rho b vn1 times a1. In other words, we simply figure out what the normal velocity is and multiply by the area and rho and b. And so this entire expression, if we make this assumption a uniform flow at section 1, at section 2, and at section 3 in this pipe sketch here, um, we could write that this quantity here, right, our DEB system with time is equal to the time rate of change, control volume, rho b v plus, or in this case it would be minus uh, rho b v1 a1 plus rho b v2 a2 plus rho b v3 a3. Okay. Once again, this minus occurs because the normal velocity at 1 is negative with respect to the normal vector on 1. Um, so this illustration goes to show that we, like, while we need to understand this in terms of vector calc and being able to do integrals over a surface, uh, in a lot of cases, if you're given simplified control surfaces and simplified velocity profiles, uh, those integrals become very trivial to evaluate. Uh, the other thing that this shows is that we don't need to simply have one inlet and one outlet in a control volume, right? In this case, we've shown we have one inlet, two outlets, and both of those outlets are accounted for. Uh, and you can have as many inlets and as many outlets as you want. A good example is doing a control volume analysis of flow through the human heart, right? Where you have multiple inlets, outlets, uh, that are all sharing flow between them, okay? And maybe we'll get to that as an example. Uh, in chapter five, but uh, don't don't lock yourself into thinking that there's only one place the flow comes in and only one place the flow goes out. And then the second of our sort of tips and tricks is what happens when uh, your control volume isn't actually stationary. You know what happens when it's moving. Um, why isn't uh, like when you expand the second integral? Why is it equal to zero from the continuity equation? We have like v one a one equal to v two a two plus v two plus v a three. It will be equal to zero if you have a steady flow and if you're talking about like conservation of mass. Okay, but in this case, that little b doesn't necessarily like it could be um, it could be a kinetic energy problem where b is one half v squared, and in that case, you're not necessarily going to have the same amount of kinetic energy entering as you have leaving. Um, Uh, but we'll, the, the, I'm going to answer that question exactly in the beginning of chapter 5. We use this to, this is what gives us the continuity equation, actually, this Reynolds transport theorem. Okay. So um, for moving control volumes, uh, try to make this pretty simple. Consider, again, we have a, a control volume looks like this. We've got some velocity field that describes the fluid velocity. Okay, so just as in our previous cases, but in addition, our control volume itself is moving with some velocity v c v. Okay. And once again, Right, we'll bound this thing with control surfaces. 
So um, we're going to define a new velocity vector, w, okay, which is equal to the difference between the fluid velocity and the control volume velocity. And the way we can interpret this is the velocity of the fluid relative to the control volume. In other words, if you were to, instead of, be stand, instead of being standing on Earth, if you were to be in a coordinate system that's following the control volume through space, um, w is, would be the apparent velocity of the fluid. Um, so if we write out our Reynolds transport theorem one more time, dv plus the integral over the control surface of rho b the question is now, what velocity is it going to be that's carrying fluid across the control surface? Right. It's going to be moving across the control surface, not with the velocity that's dictated by the fluid, but with the, uh, the velocity relative <coughs> to the control surface itself. So instead of putting the fluid velocity in here, we would find w, and we would put w into this box. And in fact, this is a good habit to get into because what if your control volume velocity is zero? In that case, W simply equals V, and it, and it reduces back to the form we had before. Uh, so that's the end of the new material. Sorry I didn't get to the examples. I'll post them on ICON, uh, and we'll get to applications on this starting Monday.